Um, I want to sort of spend some time before I introduce our interlocutors, highlighting that this webinar is part of a fall series of webinars that I've curated to provide additional resources to applicants during the active competition period as they're drafting their application materials. And the inspiration for this really came out of conversations with former reviewers of both the ACLS Digital Justice Program and also our DEX, our Digital Extension Program, around applicant engagement and what we were doing to support applicants during the active competition. And so in a lot of ways, these webinars are our attempt at you know, unveiling the so-called hidden curriculum that goes into grant writing by inviting back former reviewers from these programs in order to engage with prospective applicants in real time. Now, this is the third of such webinar. There are six totals. The first was a general information session where I discussed program parameters and the ethos of the program. I dove a little deeper into the eligibility requirements, the, the application components, and also had a discussion around the differences between the seed and development. The second session was on data ethics, and I invited Professor Kim Gallen from Brown University and archivist Lael Hughes-Watkins from the University of Maryland College Park to discuss strategies for how you can best articulate your data ethics plan throughout your proposal narrative. So if you missed either or both of those sessions, you can find both of the recordings and the transcripts, as well as any slides on the ACLS website on the Digital Justice Grants uh, Supplementary Materials webpage. And so my colleague, Katie, is gonna pop that into the chat for you right now, just so that you can have that for your reference. Today, we are tackling the topic of capacity building, given that it is a new priority of the program. So unlike in the pilot year of digital justice, in this new iteration of digital justice, we are specifically looking to support projects that engage in some kind of capacity building activities. And what we mean by that is simply thinking about the conditions, whether they be institutional, financial, technological, or related to personnel that allow you to do your work. And so to give you a clear sense of how we'll spend our time today, we'll start with a general discussion with our interlocutors around capacity building, what we mean by that, and sort of discuss the wide range of activities that can fall under that umbrella for digital humanities projects. After this general discussion, we'll transition into smaller breakout rooms. And in each room, there'll be one interlocutor and one ACLS staff member. So the purpose of these smaller sort of breakout sessions is to give you all the opportunity to talk more extensively about some of the issues raised in the general discussion. If you have any questions or um, sort of thoughts that you wanna continue working through. And you can also use that space to get feedback on the parts of your application that are related to this particular topic. So I wanna flag again that the general discussion will be recorded so that folks can look at this asynchronously, but the part of the sessions where we go into the breakout rooms will not be recorded just to respect people's privacy. They are going to talk about their works in progress or things that they're still you know, considering as they map out their um, proposal narrative. So we'll then reconvene in the breakout room for closing remarks and also just a little bit of housekeeping in terms of important dates that are coming up um, and also a post webinar survey to get your thoughts on your experience today. And now that I have gotten through a bit of the housekeeping, I have the pleasure of introducing our very esteemed interlocutors for today. So we are joined by Dr. Lorena Guthrow, who is the Digital Programs Manager for the U.S. Latino Digital Humanities Center at the University of Houston and a Rare Book School Mellon Foundation Diversity, Inclusion, and Cultural Heritage Fellow. She received her PhD in English and her Master's in Hispanic Studies, both from Rice University. We are also joined by Professor Morimoto, Ryo Morimoto, who is a first-generation college graduate and scholar from Japan and an assistant professor of anthropology at Princeton University. His scholarly work addresses the planetary impacts of our past and present engagement with nuclear things. He is the author of Nuclear Ghosts, Atomic Livelihoods in Fukushima's Gray Zone, and Rio is the facilitator of the native undergraduate student-led project, Nuclear Princeton, and a former manager of the Japan Disasters Digital Archive. 
So I wanna give a kind of virtual clap for our interlocutors and thank them for being here today. So with any kind of discussion like this, I think it's really, really important that we're all operating from a shared vocabulary and a common framework around the topic that we're talking about. And so the first question is always the basic question of what do we mean by capacity building? Especially when we consider that it can take many forms and is very much informed by one's institutional context. So I wanna start there by asking both of our interlocutors, how would you define capacity building? What kinds of activities constitute capacity building? So um, when I think about capacity building, I think about the ways in which we need to ask ourselves, like what do we need to do our work from both the day-to-day to, -day to the long-term? So what are the things that you need in place to be successful. I can keep going, but I don't wanna like take everything up. So I'll pass that and we can get more granular as we go. Okay, uh, I guess, you know, I want to kind of follow up by adding that I want to kind of think about this particular grant, right? That is the digital justice grant. And I want to kind of think with you all about how this idea or the term of justice might fit into in terms of thinking uh, capacity building. And I think, you know, as, you know, mentioned, this this capacity building can be very sort of a vague term, you know, it could mean many things. But I, I would like to sort of encourage all of us to think about what if we think about capacity building with you know, category like justice and how, what are the kind of new things that we might be able to suggest in terms of including this particular thing that is critical for this particular grant. Like for example, you know, are we thinking about justice and capacity building, thinking about like giving some sort of a sense of control to the particular communities that you'd be interested in working? Or are we thinking about including some of the student body as a way to think about, you know, think of them as a capacity also, or the potential that can become something, right? Because I think, you know, later question, maybe there's some dimension of sustainability that might have something to do with it. But one thing I want to mention is that, you know, because different institutions might have a different understanding of, you know, what resources might be available. So do not hesitate to really explain about what are the things that missing in your institution? Because otherwise some of the reviewers like myself coming from very resourceful university might not notice or think about that kind of stuff, right? So I would just stop there. I'm really happy that you brought up the issue of labor because I think something that I've noticed in um, several grant applications, not just for this um, grant, but for other uh, grants and other foundations is people who do not take in consideration labor and budget. And um, we see a disconnect between the social justice goal of the project and then the way in which they're compensating the people who are doing the labor. So students or community members who are getting paid, either not getting paid or getting paid very little, um, whereas the PI might be getting paid a ton and then um, expecting these other workers to do the majority of the job. So when you're creating your budget, that social justice part should also be a part of it um, because this labor is going to be integral to the project as well. I wanna thank both of you for lifting up um, those issues in terms of thinking about justice as part of the work of capacity building or building that into the, the framework. Um, and also just to say a little bit even about why this theme or this thread of capacity building is a new priority of the grant because it wasn't the case in the pilot year that, that we asked specifically for this. And you know, it comes out of conversations um, related to the Digital Commission on Fostering and Sustaining Diverse Digital Scholarship that ACLS is currently running, where we convened the group, we convened a lot of focus groups actually of different constituencies in the world of DH, but particularly former and current grantees of Dext and Digital Justice talking about 
just the infrastructures that were in place or not in place at their various institutions that made it difficult or easier to do their work. And so if we are thinking about strengthening the ability for folks to do digital work across the board, you know, the prompts around capacity building really do function in service of giving reviewers a more granular sense of the context in which people are pursuing their work. And so it's not the case that we are looking for projects that, you know, with the small 10,000 seed grant, you are going to completely create digital humanities and mm -hmm. digital humanities center at your institution. We really want to be respectful of scale in that way, but it is an opportunity for you to tell us, you know, as Professor Morimoto um, sort of highlighted what things are not available to you at your university that these grant funds might complement in terms of helping you to do your work and also putting other people relative to the work to do it a little bit uh, easier, mm -hmm. yeah. right? Now I want to follow up because one of the things I noticed from, uh, you know, serving the review, there are many great projects you know, many ambitious projects, and I can see the value of those projects. But at the same time, like you had to wonder, like, well, in order for this to happen, how many people have to be involved and, you know, how this small amount of seed money has to be distributed across these groups, right? So I think one thing to remember is that this grant itself is really about building the capacity in order to be able to get to this bigger picture. So I think, you know, it's not a bad thing to say, here's the big picture, but we want to start with this little things. And then for this thing, we need the money, right? Right, exactly. And and I want to, again, lift up uh, Dr. Guthrow's point about labor, right? Because that serves as a good segue into thinking about um, capacity building more specifically or getting more granular with it of what kinds of activities constitute capacity building. And obviously thinking about labor is a significant part of that. But could you provide some uh, concrete examples of what these efforts have looked like, either in your own digital projects or projects that you consulted or own or supervised? What when people start to think about capacity building, not just as the framework, but as the actual work that's being done, what things could, should they be keeping in mind? Well, I can I can start. Uh, so you know, the project I work with native students, uh, I you know. Right now, because of the lack of support of Native students on campus, I focus, you know, uh, who I work with based on their identities and commitment to elevating the voices of uh, Native students. And as such, students who come to my project might not have the necessary skills to be able to really produce digital, you know, stuff that I might be showcasing using websites and other means. So. To me, you know, capacity buildings involve identifying resources on campus that might be able to provide some training for students to be able to get some of the skills that they might be able to then use for the project, right? So that, you know, looking around, talking to different, you know, constituency on campus itself, to me, is a building capacity for the project. Yeah, and then in that vein, also thinking about the sustainability, because if you ask for a bunch of money for um, like a, I don't know, a software, but you don't have the connection to help with you sustain it or get the training, then you're missing that piece of the puzzle. So if you're going to, you know, you need this software for your group, for your team, um, do you have someone that will give you the training, the tech support, um, the, you know, you might need technical backup. So working with your, um, your institution's IT might be important or funding a position for someone that can uh, provide that tech support. So thinking about the ways in which this will last longer or have like longer effects than just during the grant period. So if I buy the software, if I buy this machine, will I only be able to use it for a couple of years or will I be able to build on it and use it going forward? Yeah, and also like this is more of a strategic uh, point, but uh, I highly encourage you to uh, look at the bigger grant that ACLS offers in addition to the seed 
grant that you might be interested because that bigger grant is basically where you want to get to after getting the seed grant, right? So by looking at what are the things that are being asked for the bigger one, you might be able to find the target of like, okay, in order for me to apply for that thing in the next round, what are the kind of capacities that I should be building in the context of my project? That might be a good way of thinking objectively about the, the capacity that might be something that, you know, the reviewer would say like, oh, yes, I can see that the, you are building something towards this big thing. Yeah, I think you bring up a good point about how, you know, capacity building always feels like a somewhat incomplete phrase to me because it begs the question of capacity building towards what or what are we building capacity towards, you know, what are we trying to, to do globally? And so I'm wondering, um, you know, you both have sort of highlighted engagement with students or even engagement with um, other corners of one's institution, whether that be IT folks who can help sort of help you build out the tech infrastructure of a project. But could you say a little bit about, um, I guess, if you are interested in doing projects that involve community partners in some way or that are folks outside of your immediate institution, how does working with community partners sort of fold into one's capacity building efforts? I think making sure you have developed trust, trust and relationships with community members or community organizations, it's really important. So it's important to do that before. You know, it's not, you can't just say in your grant, I want to form this relationship and you've never talked to these people before, or this organization before, because that's making a lot of assumptions. So trust takes a very long time to establish. So it's really helpful to put in your grant if you already have um, a relationship with an organization that you hope to work with. Um, that way you are continuing that and maybe that a uh, grant is to either fund training for a community organization you're working with, or maybe like internships if you're working with youth organizations, or you know funding the the labor that you're expecting, et cetera. So thinking through that, I think is really, really important because you want to make sure that this is a reciprocal uh, relationship and not some point, same, something where only your institution or your group is receiving all the benefit. There needs to be a, a back and forth for, for both uh, groups. Yeah, that point really reminded me of the couple of uh, grants that we reviewed last time that really like talked about or identified the needs from the communities. You know, I think there was some project where using some of the, um, you know, um, tablets and stuff like that to go around and do stuff. But part of the grant was to basically provide those instruments for that community to be able to do X. And then that was a good way of indicating, you know, that they have already established some kind of relationship. They find out, identify the needs of the communities and what they might be able to do by providing certain stuff. So, you know, I think that's another way I guess you can kind of think about, you know, showing that, you know, in fact, you have already established some relationship and we know what they're looking for. And then if we have this, we can make this happen. So um, that's another thing, I guess, yeah, came to my mind. Yeah, both of those comments sort of remind me of the really wonderful conversation um, that I had with the interlocutors for the data ethics webinar. So again, I just wanna flag that for folks um, if you haven't watched it, but really the importance of um, building relationships prior to applying for a grant so that you can talk about some of the pre-work that you've already done. And also so that at every instance of project design and implementation, if you are working with community partners, they're part of the project design. And so I think, you know, again, to lift up Dr. Guthrow's point about the labor of this, right? And, Dr. and Professor Mary Moto's point about what community assets are needed so that you get a good sense of that. Um, sort of being in dialogue with folks, even as you're drafting your application is critical. And so, you know, if you're constantly straddling this line between sort of thinking about um, 
what is available to you outside of your institution in terms of the relationships that you have to cultivate with community, community partners to do your work, and also the resources that are available to you within your institution, whether those be um, students that you would want to work with or IT folks that you want to work with or folks in libraries. What are some just very concrete questions or considerations that might provide insight onto the different kinds of infrastructures that are already available to people. And so another way of thinking about this question is, how can I survey the landscape that I currently inhabit to talk about that in a grant application? Because I think doing that sort of institutionally reflective work might not be immediately apparent um, in terms of drafting the application materials. And so if you were um, prompted in that way, what kinds of questions would you ask yourself around you know, figuring out what's available to you. So I think there's probably certain departments that you want to target first. Libraries, archives, um, tech might be some of the ones you're gonna think of off the top of your head. You might also look into um, like media. So if you want to do professional photo photography or videography, or even recording that might be available at your institution. So that's kind of outside the, 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 the typical things you might think of. Um, and so you, you need to sit down and have conversations about uh, how much time they can dedicate, how many people they can dedicate to your project, um, how they would like to be included. So, you know, are they a full project partner? Um, are you gonna have named partners from their, um, department and each department might have rules on like how much a percentage of the time that someone can commit so you know if you're working with the library and you want uh, I don't know like a metadata uh, librarian to work with you as a consultant uh, they might say okay I can work like 10 percent of my time or I can give you a workshop that lasts this long and so just identifying the very concrete things that you want someone to do what you need help on I think is really important and and asking how long this commitment will last is it just going to last for the grant or are they committing to continuing this collaboration as you know kind of like in the future is there sustainability is there money that um other groups can offer so you know is can the dean uh, offer to continue to pay you know, maybe like an internship, or um, if you bring in somebody new, can they commit to paying maybe half or that full salary from now on so that that is part of that capacity, right? And if, you know, maybe they want to pay half and then you say, we're going to fundraise the other half from now on or, or seek other grants. So I think those are important things that come to my mind. Yeah, so I mean, I guess covered a lot of ground. So I guess I'll try to approach this question a little bit differently as an anthropologist. That is that it's a daunting work <laughs> to try to talk across, you know, different parts of the campus and, you know, find out who has what, who can do what kind of stuff. But I will, I want you to kind of have this attitude of like each individual you might go and then inquire about, you know, the availability of resources or, you know, tools and other stuff. You, I want you to kind of think of it as like you are pitching your potential grant idea to these people as well. And you're getting feedback as to how they might be reacting to, you know, how you're presenting your pr pr proposal. And if they're not reacting well to your proposal, maybe there's a way you have to think about how you go about pitching your project as a testing ground before you even like craft your seed grant, right? Like, you know, if your communities are not really buying your idea, the chance is that the reviewers might be, you know, asking questions about, oh, is this possible, whatever. So one way to think about it is like, yes, this is like a very um, hard work, but it could be beneficial for you to really think about how you might go about selling your project to, you know, your neighbors, so to speak, first. 
and then you can if you can convince them and say like well that sounds like an exciting project we might be able to stretch a little bit to you know give you this resources we have then the chance is like your maybe your project is very uh, attractive for those outside as well so i think you know this is a slightly different way of answering the questions but i kind of want all of you to remember this task actually could be very helpful for you to imagine crafting your um, proposal. Yeah, I think it's so, that's a, such a great point around, I guess, surveying the landscape in terms of your immediate institutional home, right? Um, to see if there are partners available there. And I love the point too about, you know, go to the library, partner with librarians. They are really, really fantastic at doing this work and also thinking about questions of sustainability and where the project will live long after the grand term, which I think is really, really important to think about even at the, at the seed phase. And so to switch gears a slightly a little bit, but since this is a webinar for capacity building for seed grants specifically, so for startup projects specifically, I wanted to ask about scale, right? And to really think through what is the appropriate balance between ambition, right? As we are, I'm sure we're all familiar with either writing grant applications or, or sketching out um, an idea for a project and having it be very grandiose. And we want it to be ambitious and we want it to, have uh, as much impact as possible, and then coming up against the practical reality of a reasonable scope of activities, uh, especially for startup projects. And so I know that that's somewhat you know, a difficult question, but where would you locate an appropriate balance between those two things? Or are there sort of specific things that you could sort of use as a check balances to make sure that you're not tipping one way or or the other. You know, I think about something like the budget, for example, as a very concrete tool that can help you think about ambition versus feasibility or versus um, the appropriate scope of, of activity. So, so is there anything you could share with us around that that question? I think um, just really that defining what the end goal is is really important because if you have like all these different things then that might be an indication that you're trying to do too much um also you know what um, professor morimoto mentioned like talking to people like so if you're identifying and, and you can tell that person this is what my project is this is what i need from you then that helps you narrow down the scope as well. Because if you don't know what you're asking people for, or if you're asking too many things of them, you might be trying to do too much. Um, you also should look at that timeline. So creating a timeline of activities is really important because it, it will help you start thinking like, is this possible to complete in this amount of time, you know? people get sick, people have babies, people uh, go on vacation, you know, all these things need to be factored in. So you're probably not going to be able to do too much between November and January 1st, right? So, so taking that into account is really important. There's, there's human beings, you're not machines, right? Um, you don't want to kill yourself to complete this grant either. Yeah, no, I think those are all great points. And I guess, you know, ultimately this is about grant, right? So the reviewer probably would be, you know, evaluating based on the, you know, deliverable, right? Like, is this possible? And I think that, you know, what's possible probably depends on the capacity that institutions that you're applying from already have. And the scale might change depending on, you know, the available resources. Um, so I think, you know, it's relative to your positions. And I think therefore, as we discussed earlier, um, you know, being honest about what you have, what you don't have is a very important way to say, okay, given what I have, this scale is like it makes sense and what makes it possible for me to deliver what I'm proposing. And I think, you know, one good metrics here is to come back to our earlier point about to ask the question about, is this just, you know, given what I have, 
what I'm proposing is adjust to those who are involved, right? That might be a good way of thinking about where to position yourself in terms of scale, because I don't think reviewers are looking everybody to be doing like this grandiose project and why not. I think reviewers are also abided by this perspective of just, right? So I think meeting at where the just is within your institutions and what you have will be the great place to think about, you know, what the appropriate scale for your project is. Yeah, and those are both wonderful and important reminders around maybe the pressures that we all face in terms of productivity, right? And having a, not only a more realistic, um, but also a justice centered uh, fo focus on the capacity that people have to do this work. And then I also wanted to sort of flag from what I have seen in terms of, um, you know, the outside looking in with current grantees of really thinking about the fact that when we are working with materials that have been historically under-resourced and underserved, even trying to get access to certain archives, having to travel to do things, even if your work includes some degree of collection building, all of the historic inequities that are the focus of the project will inform the very process of doing the work too, and that should be built into the timeline. And so your relationship to time and doing this work in a timely fashion, I think that's also something to interrogate in terms of the ambition versus the reasonable scale um, or scope of the, of the project. And so in terms of thinking about things like the budget or even the project staffing list, which is not a throwaway document, it's an important sort of activity an exercise in terms of thinking about the distribution of labor, as Dr. Goodthrow said, if you can clearly uh, sort of list the folks that you're working with and know specifically what you're asking them for, that document can also help sort of clarify the scope of what you're doing. We, yeah, we absolutely look at that staffing list. And I, I remember seeing, again, in like different uh, grants I've, I've read, where we look at that that staffing list and think like, well, why is this person doing this? And, and a lot of times I've seen like PIs say, I'm not actually a scholar in this, but I've taken this on. And then it's like, well, why, why didn't you ask someone else to head the project? Or why don't you have a co-PI? Or why don't you have, or, or why are you the PI, right? Or why didn't you bring people in who actually are experts in this? So making sure that you are picking the people who are appropriate for the job is really important. And you also should mention that they are like why they're appropriate for that job. No, I just, just second that because that reminded me that we had a couple of conversation asking about why is this person doing this stuff, right? And I think that was a very important dimension when we were evaluating uh, various grants. So yeah, I, I just want to emphasize that point as well. So thank you for mentioning that. So the last question uh, that I'd like to pose before we transition into our uh, smaller breakout rooms is around that dreaded word attached to most grants, which is around outputs. Right. What are the outputs of the grant? What are the or the deliverables um, is another sort of way that folks frame it. And so how would you anticipate or measure the impact specifically of the capacity building efforts? Um, and it's sort of almost like asking folks to look at a crystal ball in some ways of how can you sort of predict the future around what capacity building efforts, like what they will generate or what you hope they generate. And so what kinds of um, measures do you think folks are able to think about before the work starts that feel sort of reasonable and realistic in terms of um, the capacity building efforts? So uh, I guess that's definitely a difficult questions. Um, but the way I would like to see or myself try to, you know, do when I, you know, apply for grant is that this is the place I think we can kind of uh, paint a vision beyond the money or the grant you're asking for the capacity building. That is like that sort of like, okay, we want to get here. 
so that we can go to that place, kind of show the trajectory is a good way of showing that, oh, this movement makes sense, right? Because without having that kind of like, you know, mid to long term goal, deliverable might not make much sense. That is like, I can ask, like, well, why are you doing this? Right. So I think one way to think about how to sort of make your deliverable convincing is to show that how this, you know, first step is connected to something where this project can go in the future. So, you know, that might be a way I would think about, you know, to say like, okay, this deliverable, given what I have, makes sense because my pass is here. I think also documentation is really important. So um, if you, you, so you should be documenting how you're doing everything and the, um, the decisions that you're making. And then also think about like how this, what, what type of impact this is having. So if you're having like a, a public workshop or even invite only workshop, how many people attended? You know, you can get them to respond to a survey, maybe where you ask very specific questions um, that will tell you about the progress and whether or not you're achieving certain goals, right? So coming up with the goals that you want to achieve with this deliverable is really important. Um, if you have a public event, you know, trying to find out how many people attended is something concrete that you can um, measure, right? That measurable output. Um, if you're inviting more community members to participate or more like organizations, like how many organizations, or um, if you're collect doing like archival collections, how many collections? Um, so these kind of uh, quantifiable outcomes are important too, but also think about like how that can inform uh, what you do moving forward. If you're creating a public facing digital project, like how many uh, visitors are you getting? Like, are people actually looking at it and using it? And so this, yeah. So like quantifiable is important too. Yeah, I think that point about process, documenting process is so important and something that I definitely want to lift up as um, an output for any kind of grant that you get or any kind of project that you get, right? Because part of, you know, the efforts around capacity building is to avoid the dreaded having to reinvent the wheel every time. And that could be for projects that you do after this one that may be funded by ACLS. It could be for other projects that people in different parts of your university or college or institution are curious about doing. It could be partners in other sort of institutions. And so I think focusing on documenting process as one of the potential outputs for thinking about capacity uh, building or as it's related to capacity building is it's an easy but very very impactful win I think that would be really important so now that we've spent some time sort of uh, talking generally about capacity building in this larger group we're going to transition into smaller breakout sessions where again you'll have the opportunity to either delve a little bit uh, more deeply into some of the topics we talked about in this larger session or get some concrete feedback on things that you're thinking about related to your project. So we'll stay in those breakout sessions for about uh, 25 to 30 minutes, depending on how discussion is going, and then we'll reconvene in this larger session for closing remarks. So can I ask Katie if you can open up the breakout rooms so that way we can get started? All right. All right, so I want to extend first a very warm thank you to our interlocutors, Professor Rio Morimoto and Dr. Lorena Goodthrow for sharing their time, their expertise, their wisdom with us today. Um, I always get a lot out of these conversations and I learned so much from engaging with them in conversation. And so I just want to, again, a virtual uh, applause for them. I also want to extend a thank you to everyone who showed up today and asked questions, which I think always works to the benefit of the entire Entire group. And so, as I mentioned, this session will be recorded and posted to YouTube, so you're able to reference it or send it to colleagues who may have missed the session. 
But before we wrap up, I also want to ask for a small favor. So I am a firm believer in the value of revision and not just to our writing projects, but also for programs like this. I try to approach this work iteratively. And although I've managed to make some pretty significant changes from the pilot year to this year, there's still a lot of work to be done in terms of having this program live up to the aspiration of its name of digital justice. And so I really wanted to ask for uh, feedback, candid feedback from folks who engage with ACLS, you all as prospective applicants or as former applicants. So that way we can make the necessary adjustments and changes to the program that make the process of applying a little less onerous. And that also offers some resources for folks that they can leverage for other opportunities. So that way, even if you're not selected as a grantee, you still get something out of the process of applying and that we can lower the barriers of entry for applying so that more folks are able to do so. So Katie is going to post in the chat a link to a post webinar survey. It's very, very short, five questions that hopefully gives us a sense of how useful these sessions are. The survey asks you to consider whether or not you'd be open to being contacted about participating in a focus group in the spring once the competition is over about your experiences navigating the competition. So that includes attending this webinar or other webinars if you've been to them, the clarity of the application, how easy it is to even navigate the application interface um, in the portal. And so that particular answer to the question around being contacted for the focus group doesn't lock you into participating. It just gives us a starting point for outreach once we do the work of inviting folks to that focus group in the spring. So once you've been able to access that in the chat, I'm going to spend the next couple of minutes just walking through some uh, housekeeping issues, things to keep on your radar uh, as you think about applying. So I wanna start with highlighting the fact that the obvious that the deadline for applications is December 15th at 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time after this date and time our online fellowship application will no longer allow for submissions. So this is also the deadline by which the administrators at your respective institutions uh, should submit their institutional verification. So as I talk about in the general information session, there is a part of the application called the institutional verification form. It is not a letter of recommendation. It is not a reference letter. It's simply a very quick 20 minute um, form that administrators can fill out to verify that you have access to the technological infrastructure at your institution and that the work that you're doing would count towards um, things like promotion and tender and, and tenure. So that is, at that date, everything has to be submitted. Other dates to keep in mind are that the selection committee will be meeting in March of 2024, and then we will notify folks of decisions via email in May of 2024. So finally, I wanted to um, highlight the remaining webinars in this fall series that we have for digital justice. So on November 10th at 1 p.m., we'll be talking about capacity building again, but for development grants. And I think even if you are um, at, you know, not applying to the development grants or considering applying to seed grants, as Professor Morimoto reminded us earlier, it's still helpful to think about the long-term trajectory of these projects and to even look at some of the projects that have been funded through the development grant as a way of conceptualizing where you'd like your own work to go. Uh, and I also think that given the interlocutors will be engaging during that session, which include uh, Professor Marissa Parham, who's at the University of Maryland at College Park and our very own vice president of ACLS, James Shulman, they will be talking about different questions related to um, sort of where projects live institutionally and how you make that decision and how you build up your project in different kinds of contexts. So that could be you know, really interesting and relevant information for you to consider even at the beginning phases of your project. The final two webinars are a lot more casual in style. They are applicant Q&As with 
uh, ACLS staff, aka myself and Katie, uh, where you can just drop in if you have any questions about the application, about um, the online fellowship portal, around eligibility requirements, any sort of questions like that. You can just pop in, ask your question, chat with us, have some coffee, and then and then pop out. Um, and so those will be on November 20th at 2 p.m. And then the final one is about a week before the deadline, which is on uh, December 8th. And again, all of the recordings will be available on the Digital Justice Supplementary Materials page, with the exception of the applicant Q&As. Those sessions will not be recorded. So, once again, I want to thank you for your time. Best of luck with your application. If you have any further inquiries, uh, you can send those to digitaljustice at acls.org. Thank you for spending your afternoon with us. And again, thank you to Professor uh, Morimoto and Dr. Guthrow for joining us today.